I'm King Lincoln, it's after April 1st, and that means it's time for the Humble Choice April 2024 review. While a lot of people fell for the fake Humble Choice list, this list is not a fool, whatever that means. This is the actual list of games in the Humble Choice, and while it won't match the fake list, this one has a lot of hidden power behind it for the right player. But before we go looking at the entire bundle, let's talk about what each game is, who's going to like it, what's good and what's bad about the offerings. I'm also going to start adding a link to the stream in the description for people who think the clips here are not long enough. I agree, but if you want 8 hours of me looking like a goober while playing games, there you go. Let's start with what's on the screen. Victoria 3, yet another Paradox game. Victoria 3 is what Paradox is known for, games that have a large multiple nation world where you can choose to rule any nation and try to do really anything you want. There are no set victory conditions, so it's a chance to simulate running a country, building it up like you want, you set the production queue, try to get bills passed and try to avoid civil war or upsetting too many groups in your country. Or as someone suggested in my chat, just let the game run at top speed and get about the same result rather than pausing and trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And I think he was right. I'm sure there's a way to micromanage this stuff, but also a lot of things took minutes of just waiting for actions to be taken or laws to be put in place. Pick this up if you like Paradox games. Their games tend to need players to watch hours of tutorial or play the game for 20 to 40 hours to decide if they like the title. However, I also have heard from people who love these games that Victoria 3 was pretty weak for Paradox, whereas Victoria 2 was better. Overall though, I don't think this delivers anything I'd want to play again, or spend tens of hours to learn to realize I don't want to play it again. The Callisto Protocol, Deader Space. The Callisto Protocol is a horror game that doesn't even try to hide its inspirations on its sleeve, it shows it on the collar. Everything about this game screams Dead Space, from the life bar on the back of your player's neck, to the inventory system floating in midair in the game world. The Callisto Protocol tries to evoke memories of Dead Space, which is good because I think that's also how it was sold. I can sum up my problem with Callisto Protocol in one fact. To dodge enemy attacks, you hold left or right on the thumbstick, and then if they attack a second time, you hold the opposite direction. Not hit it in time with the attack, but just hold a direction. If that doesn't sound challenging, well, it's not. There also was a point where you changed a club for a stun baton, and the combat didn't feel like it changed at all. Callisto Protocol also struggles to really be scary because most of the jump scares are pre-scripted videos, but if you ever are afraid something's gonna jump out at you, hold the stick to the left, just in case. See, it's kind of dumb. Also, just saying, I think the third person made it hard to be really scared during several of the horror moments because you're watching actions being done to the player's avatars, not experiencing those actions. Pick this up if you were waiting for a heavy discount to Callisto Protocol. This game got a lot of popularity leading up to its release, and then kind of disappeared quickly. I'm not the person to ask about a horror game necessarily, but I also found this one to be more lacking than scary. Acho que podemos buscar um objetivo em conjunto. Concorda? Forget all that? Become friends? No way. Humankind. Experience the entirety of humanity. The fastest explanation of what humankind is would be to say it's like a different version of civilization. There are a lot of changes here, such as not choosing a single civilization, but rather adopting a new culture with different bonuses for each era as you go through the game, and a far superior battle system. But at the end of the day, this has all the same computer board game type of appeal that civilization has, as well as all the complexity. However, a lot of people turned on this game after a long time citing the AI isn't strong or cheats. This is the first game in the franchise, and while this is Amplitude Studio known for the Endless Space franchise, it does feel a little lacking. At the same time, if this is seen as the first entry in a longer franchise, there's a ton of potential. However, that potential is in future titles. Also, the text on the UI is frighteningly small. I usually play all my games on a 50-inch TV connected to my computer, and this one was unplayable, but even on a normal monitor, it's really a bit smaller than I would like, and I struggled. Pick this up if you like Civilization. In the bundle, it's 12 bucks, and you easily get 20 hours out of it, and likely more. This has a nice, different feel to it, and like I said, I prefer this combat system to Civilization's combat. You will have to learn all the differences, but you get a unique experience here. Also, this is the definitive edition, so all the DLC content is here. <coughs> Fashion Police Squad, finally someone arrests people wearing socks with sandals. 
Fashion Police Squad looks like a boomer shooter and it does have a taste of that. Players will end up fighting fashion crimes whether it's people who are dressed all in grey, wearing neon shirts, or ill-fitting suits. Players will shoot them with a die shotgun, a sewing machine gun, or sock gnomes. It does sound insane, but it's actually quite funny with a ton of great moments and it's also well written. I found myself laughing multiple times. At the same time, this is a humorous take on the shooter genre, but it does have some issues. So far, every enemy is only weak to a single weapon, so if you shoot someone wearing a bad suit with a die shotgun, it does zero damage. In addition, the difficulty here mostly comes from the number of enemies than the specific enemies themselves, and I'm sure the absurdity of it will wear off eventually, definitely not yet though, and probably will last the full first playthrough. But it does feel more like a joke that's great the first time, but you've probably heard it the second time. Pick this up if you want a refreshing boomer shooter, this is unique for what it is and honestly I feel compelled to play more of it just to see what it's going to do next, really solid game. Terraformers, Building Mars Your Way Terraformers starts with the player building a base on Mars, creating locations for people to live in, and then expanding across the surface of Mars. The players will have to spend a lot of time resource harvesting so they can play various structures, and each structure needs specific resources and has a purpose, but the goal of the game is to earn victory points. As you proceed in the game, you also have to start terraforming Mars, likely as a way to earn more victory points. This reminds me of playing Euro games, and I mean that as a highest form of praise I can. It also doesn't feel too difficult, but I realize I'm only playing the tutorial, there's supposedly multiple scenarios after that point that extend the game and likely become much harder. At the same time, it feels like there's a significant amount of RNG in the game, whether it's which leader you can choose from, what building appears, or what resource you will find. Players will have to make a lot of decisions and hope for the best. There are probably a few ways to fail, but I imagine on harder difficulties, this game becomes more brutally punishing for those wrong choices. It also feels a little micromanagement of the resources, but that's likely because I don't know exactly how to play the game yet. Pick this up if you like board games. This isn't exactly Civilization, but it also feels like it's in the same family as a distant cousin. Terraformers allows players to challenge the scenario or situation they're in, rather than fighting against a specific AI. Symphony of War, The Nephilim Saga. A song of Fire Emblem and, uh, just Fire. Fire Emblem. Symphony of War starts with the main character and a friend going off to fight in a battle to get a kidnapped empress back. During the battle, they meet up with people they knew when they were cadets, and this is all done in the background of a large strategy RPG where players will move their characters tactically around the map and take out units. It's a lot like Fire Emblem, and that's a good thing because the battle system here is solid and adds a few new tricks. You can fill out your squad as you want, change characters' classes to try out new things, and build a larger army than the Fire Emblem games. At the same time, this is more of a pure strategy RPG with a focus more on roleplaying and tactically maneuvering your troops rather than just overpowering the enemy. The maps feel overwhelming when you first reach them, but then almost feel too small once you finish them. Also, people have pointed out this has a lot of RPG maker assets, but if that's what enables a team to make a 30 hour or more game with a small team, the more power to them. This is a $20 title after all, not a big $60 one. Pick this up if you like the strategy RPG genre. This is more Fire Emblem than Disgaea if you know what I mean, but there's a little bit of a feel of Advance Wars or War Groove as well, and so far it's delivering on all cylinders. There's an obvious turn coming in, but it would be worth playing more of the game just to see that story. Koromon. It's Pokemon. Koromon has such an obvious influence, it ends in the syllable Mon, but at the same time it does everything that you wanted to see. This has a customizable difficulty with interesting choices like limited heals at the doctor, limits to the monsters you can catch, or even being able to catch other trainers monsters. Every character also gets a trait when it's caught, and those traits make two similar creatures vastly different. There's also the ability to customize the stats of your creatures and so much more. Compared to the main genre, which feels like it's stagnating on time, Koromon feels like a breath of fresh air that the fans of the genre have been begging for. But at the same time, it is Pokemon with much of the same negatives. You've seen much of this idea before, and while there are tons of fresh moments, the majority of the game is leveling up monsters, fighting X number of bosses, this time elements or something, and while there are new abilities, you feel like you've seen all of this before. Also, there are only 124 monsters here, and while there is more content in other areas, having fewer characters in the first Pokemon game is a weird choice. I know, this probably has more animations or art requirements, but you know, it still feels odd. 
Pick this up if you like Pokemon. This is a pure Pokemon style game, but it's also so well done and does enough new that fans who may have been burnt out in the main series will probably find something fresh here. It's also about a 30 hour journey for the first playthrough, which is a good length. At the same time, it's not going to be changed in most players' minds if they already aren't a fan of the franchise. Aye, we aren't short of those. One night, is it? I shall need at least two nights, maybe more. Aye, not a problem. The Excavation of Hobbs Barrow, a mystery in a cozy British town. The excavation of Hobbs Barrow has players arriving at a little town in England with a ton of marshes and barrows. The player is trying to find the person who summoned them there and instead meets a lot of colorful characters at the local pub. If you played any of the Blackwell games, this is by the same company, Wadjet Eye Games. The voice acting is extremely well done and elevates the game quite a bit. However, the game does try to push the envelope with its graphics at time and honestly, I think it fails to really nail what it's attempting. It almost feels like it's not going far enough, but also similarly goes too far. The story is a bit slow so far and the, well, the characters are good and there have been a couple of simple puzzles. One of them is an item you might miss if you didn't think to pick it up and the other was more of a what can I do in this room rather than solving an obvious puzzle. Pick this up if you like Blackwell games. I assume it's going to have that paranormal spookiness at some point from this company but also the writing so far has been really good though I've yet to really get started on the main mystery. And that's what we have for the games this month. There are a few things I feel like I have to talk about with the bundle, but first, let's check is there any deal. And yes, of course there is. I'm not a huge fan of the new style on the site, but I think it does work. So let's get the bad news out of the way. Coromon and Symphony of the War were both in Humble Bundles one time before. Those two and Terraformers will put in multiple deals from Fanatical that takes up the rest of those numbers, so you might already have those games. However, the value here is really good, though I will mention the base version of Humankind has gone for $8, though this does have all the DLC, so it's worth a little more. Probably not exactly $25. Victoria 3 is a good price if you're interested, Callisto Protocol also has a lot of value, and all the games are hovering around $10. The historical low total for all the games is over $100, you can see that at the top, which is pretty good as well. Now, as for the bundle, I don't know if you really noticed when I was going through it, but I certainly did play in them. There's a ton of tactical and strategy games here, and if you like the style, Symphony of War, Terraformers, Victoria 3, and Humankind will likely appeal to the same type of players, maybe not Victoria 3. It's really good for fans of those types of games, however, for other people, the remainder is a little bit weak, but there are some interesting titles here. In addition, with Symphony of War being similar to Fire Emblem and Coromon being similar to Pokemon, we have two Nintendo-inspired games together here, and honestly, that's kind of cool. That being said, let's talk about where the games land on the tier list. As usual, I have four tiers, games worth the full bundle, strong contenders, average games, and misses. Now this is a question of my recommendation, not necessarily price or lowest price, so I try to be fair about this. Which is why nothing's in the mist here this month. Nothing even deserved to be considered for it, which, again, is a good sign. And so the bottom of the average tier is Victoria 3. I'm not a huge fan of Paradox, but when the fans of that company still think this one didn't deliver on its promise, that's a bad sign that I can't really ignore. Ultimately, I didn't really enjoy my time, and I really do agree with a lot of their complaints. It feels like you have minimal agency here. And the top of the average tier, it's the other big headliner, the Callisto Protocol. Now I know this game had a huge build up to its release, but looking at the final product, I can only imagine it's because of a great marketing campaign. The game just isn't that good or scary. I don't know, maybe I grew, but I don't think this game is that amazing. Something else I haven't mentioned, it only came out about four months ago. And this is how we look after the bottom two tiers. Oddly, we have both headliners down here, so it's probably going to be a bad month, right? Well, Strong Contenders here only has one title. Yes, one. It's the Excavation of Hobbs Barrow, with good audio, average to weak graphics, an interesting story, and the typical Wadjet style of a good point-and-click adventure. This definitely will appeal to fans of the genre, and it should. The audio is really that good. So this is how we look going into the final tier, and no, this isn't a joke. Five games do belong in this tier. The bottom of the full bundle price tier, Humankind. I think this game is great, I played it for many hours in Game Pass, but I also can understand why it might appeal to some people more than others. It's easily worth the bundle price, but I think there were four better games this month. Still, I'm thrilled to finally own this one. That leads us to Koromon. I love Pokemon, and this is a long adventure. Made even longer if you want to hunt down the potents, the perfects, play with the difficulty settings. I'm sure there's tons more to discover here. This feels like what the genre really needed. Speaking of Nintendo-inspired games, you also have Symphony of the War, and I love the style of the game for the beginning, and then I'm sure 10 hours in, I'm going to be like, screw this, because I mismanaged something. But ultimately, there are a lot of nice little improvements to the formula here, and also some good writing so far. And then of course we have Terraformers, a board game that's more focused on pleasing a colony than fighting some odd evil. Perfect. This feels like it's going to be a lot of fun to pull apart and try to master. There also seems to be a lot of content here. 
Finally, my pick of the month, it's Fashion Police Squad. It's funny, it's unique, it's not something you'll see every day, and the design is oh so good. It's probably the shortest of the games in this tier, but it's also the one I feel the strongest that people need to check out. Just a very unique idea. And this is what the final tier list looks like. Honestly, I try to think of which of those games deserve to be in strong contenders instead of full bundle price, and the answer, none of them. Now I know not everyone is going to agree with that list, and I want to hear all your opinions in the comments, trust me, but I want to throw up an alternate bundle for everyone to check out if they're interested, tying in with my absolute favorite of the month, the Boomer Shooters. If you're a fan of the genre, I say check it out. A few of those games are sequels or related to games that have already been in the Humble Choice. I think at least one of them already was bundled, and I'll leave a clean link to it in the description. You click on it if you want to see more. And with that, we once again come to the end of the program. Now, what do you guys think? Am I being too kind, or do you at least see the value that I I see this month. If you enjoyed this video, you know what to do. Subscribe, click the bell, and you get one of these videos on your feed every month. See you next time.